Welcome all to the midweek brief. Uh, welcome all to FP Markets. My name is Anthony, and as always, uh, once a week, I like to bring you the general news and see what is going on in the world and in the markets and how they're affected too. Whilst we're on the subject, please, as always, please use the Traders Hub if you're a client with us. Uh, we've access to all our articles such as uh, general fundamentals, technical analysis from our experts, upcoming events and webinars, etc. Also, please like and subscribe our YouTube channel. Uh, it really helps us to provide content like this. So let's jump straight into the first bit of news. I'm sure a lot of you may have seen it over the weekend, which was the uh, dreadful terrorist attack in Moscow. This is uh, significant. It's probably my favorite word that I'm using nowadays is significant, but a lot of what we see is a significance in the markets and uh, in the world in general. What makes this stand out is the claims afterwards and the timing of this attack. Now, at first, uh, Moscow did accuse Britain being behind it, the United States and Ukraine. Who knows what is true nowadays? We don't trade on speculation, but we do sometimes see the markets move according to speculation. But for risk management purposes, we wait for the black and white information to come out. What's strange about this is that four days prior to this happening, there were reports that uh, the UK uh, agencies did actually notify the Kremlin that there was a high probability of an attack. To be honest, British intelligence is where the, they focus most of their efforts as opposed to the military. So when the British intelligence come calling, pay attention because they might be trying to help. But at the same time, Russia claims that they're also possibly behind it. One of the reasons why is because as we look at a map of Ukraine, naturally the four gentlemen who were involved in this uh, horrible atrocity um, actually ran south to the border, which was Ukraine. That makes Russia believe that Ukraine were involved. Not necessarily, to be honest, because if we look at the west of Moscow is Belarus, Latvia and Estonia. I don't think it was likely these guys were going to uh, run there. They go to the south of Ukraine, and if they go east, then they go into Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan. So they probably thought it being a war zone might be easier for them to infiltrate and uh, escape, which didn't occur, of course, and rightly so. This doesn't necessarily mean Ukraine are involved, but there has been reports over the past few years of units within the Ukrainian army with, let's say, um, ISIS propaganda merchandise, a.k.a stickers so you know this is something that's an ongoing situation who's right we don't know but it does seem perfect time and with the election just finished out of uh, out of russia now the thing that also makes this interesting is at first they were isis affiliated but they're actually from an area called tajikistan which is 10 million people this is off to the east and center east and what makes this significant is the fact that that particular region is suffering a lot financially their economy is not good prosperity is down uh, inflation is high so some are saying this is more of an internal matter of uh, a protest against putin and moscow in general hence why moscow is the target who knows we will find out more in time and this isn't necessarily something that's going to affect a, a particular asset let's say but it's an ongoing situation which can set the foundation for future market movements we go on to election news. Biden has actually gained some territory across the blue states. Now, I say that with a slightly sarcastic tone. I'm not trying to be. But the way the news is reporting it is that he's gained across six battleground states and he's doing amazing. The truth of the matter is he needs double figures. He's up about 3% on his initial uh, opinion polls over the past few months, which is good. It's in the right direction for Biden. But he still needs to hit at least 10, 11 percent to equal or surpass Trump in neighboring states or the same states. Now, who knows? There's time. But the one thing that has significantly changed is Trump's stance. Now, Trump has actually got the back of three billionaires, and this was not foreseen. Um, the idea is that this is going to help him in the run up to November's election, but also to help pay for his civil court cases that are pending at the moment. He has a big whopping $343 million fine to pay. He does have the money, but most of Trump's assets are not liquid and they are in the form of companies or real estate. So 
outside investment coming in, make a deal, get him as president, and then it helps those billionaires. Seems the likely way forward. Biden is no different. He receives endorsement and uh, funding from mostly the tech sector. We're talking Facebook. We're talking Amazon. They've been big uh, supporters of the Democratic Party and have helped fund them over the years. So although the news, such as The Guardian, are portraying that billionaires are lining up to fund Donald Trump's anti-democratic agenda, is slightly misleading because all parties have done this since the beginning of American politics. It's called endorsement. Whether it's right or wrong is not for us to decide, but it does happen. If we actually go on to slightly different news, I say slightly, it's a very much different news, which is the Israel situation. The only development here is Israel are claiming that there is uh, no room for ceasefire at the moment because of the United States pushing for a UN resolution for a ceasefire. Now, I'm not here to say if they're right or wrong. I want to ceasefire. I think most people want to ceasefire. But at the end of the day, America only a month ago was saying they don't want a ceasefire. And then a month later, they exactly called for a ceasefire. They actually vetoed a previous UN resolution vote. Now, this is surely not coincidental with the same time that Israel are buying less missiles, less weapons from the United States, perhaps in a form of protest, but because they want to spread their business away from just America, because we've seen what's happened with their relationship over this whole thing. So ceasefire opportunities don't look likely on the table. And the sad thing is a lot of it could be down to outside influence. So perhaps a lot of countries need to back out of this. It could be UK, France, Britain, and perhaps leave this more to the Middle East neutral countries who seem to have achieved better in finding a possible, possible ceasefire resolution there. I think that would be a good path forward. And I think Hamas uh, would be a lot more open to speaking to, say, the Qataris or the Egyptians or whoever it may be, as opposed to speaking to the Americans where relations are, uh, are strained, uh, you know, str strained anyway. So that's an ongoing situation there. If we actually bring up the map, we can see significant development, mostly actually in the East Bank, uh, in the West Bank, sorry, although it's in the East. What's interesting here is we see the blue icons represent Israeli activity. The red is Hamas or opposition activity. And then you'll see the occasional orange or amber one, which represents neutral. Israel's intensified in the West Bank, its activity, and also to the north with Lebanon. However, Hezbollah in Lebanon seem to be firing back a lot more than Hamas were, but that's because of their capabilities and the fact that they're more structured. Hamas are more of a smaller organization in that sense, but they're still firing rockets. So the argument remains, Israel will keep doing this as long as rockets are being fired and as long as there's hostages. But this is a, a double-edged double -edged sword because you know Hamas are not going to give up their only leverage for possibility to sit down and talk. So there doesn't seem an end in sight. I hope there is, obviously, like most of the people watching and listening to this. But all we can see is activity is intensifying. We also go to the Red Sea area, which has uh, been no put on the news today as well. I saw it on Sky News personally. Um, this is intensifying week on week. There's more and more attacks going on. One thing that has changed in the region is Saudi Arabia before were assisting logistically. They were helping with equipment, food to the blue areas, which is government Yemenis controlled. But they've actually started shelling to the north, the Houthi rebels, and they've actually, Houthi rebels have lost a small piece of ground, but it's a, it's a significant development in that region. So this is a classic example of a lot of neighboring countries not want to get in, not wanting to get sucked into this vacuum of uh, spreading conflict, but at the same time they have to choose. And in Saudi Arabia's case, they'd rather free up the Red Sea so they can export their oil, which is where they make the majority of their money so that they can get it through the Red Sea and pass it on to their consumers. They're very simple. So they've decided to take their stance. This is likely to affect gold. This is likely to affect oil in time. If the Red Sea strikes keep intensifying, only today the British and the Americans have ruled out any ground forces going into Yemen, but they have also admitted that they're going to step up their campaigns of airstrikes and cruise missile strikes. So there doesn't seem an end to this anytime soon. The Houthi rebels are certainly not going to likely turn around and surrender. They've been doing this for 30, 40 years, especially against the Saudis and the Yemenis government. So 
a few more months, a few more years of this is really nothing to them, especially as it's been proven they're being supplied by Iran with Iranian drones. So again, this is pure proxy war situation going on. One thing we'll also remember and we'll see probably seen on the news was the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Now, this didn't affect the markets overall per se. Um, what's interesting is now we are facing a time where we read news articles and we have to start questioning what is uh, legit, what is likely happening. And quite simply here um, was a situation where a cargo ship uh, hit a bridge at one thirty in the morning. Now, question marks revolve around the fact is there was two pilots on uh, on the bridge at the time. You have two pilots that alternate with shifts, but because they were coming into the main commercial port, which is in Baltimore, they decided, okay, they, they would be on the bridge together so they can off board. And they've done this so many times. There is video footage confirming that shortly before it hit the bridge, there was a power outage. Then there was smoke rising from the engine room. This is synonymous with possibly cyber attacks. Now, I'm not saying that's what it is. A lot of the noise on the internet is saying possible cyber attacks. It's not coincidence. This also happened on the same day that the UK announced that they received a massive cyber attack that they fended off from China. Now, I'm not saying that's what's happening. The whole point of this show is to get you thinking, to get you looking at the markets, trying to put the pieces together and monitor ongoing situations. And this is definitely an ongoing situation that it could possibly be, or it could just possibly be human error. However, the human error has been ruled out by experts as well, because the two pilots involved in this have done this trip hundreds of times. In fact, they only go down the coast, and sometimes a lot of their journeys are only one or two days to take their, their cargo and come back. So this is their hometown. This is their backyard. And if we actually look at the company who owns them, Maersk, their shares, when this happened, did drop. So this goes back to when you're sitting at home and you see the news, and I'm not saying you should have traded these shares or anything like that. But when you see this news happen, just sit there and go, right, what's really happening? What's your theory on it? And who's the companies or organizations that are linked to that particular incident? And in this case, it's Maersk, who have over 100,000 employees. But this one incident managed to drop their share price quite significantly for one day. And it is recovering now. But imagine if you had been there when the news came out and then took advantage of that dip. So it's not rocket science. It's just having the confidence and the discipline to sit there and make rational decisions. Try not to think too much outside the box. Try not to get too cheeky. Um, and you should be fine. Just pay attention to the news for these opportunities. If we actually have a look at macros for the week, the first thing to touch on is Japanese yen is at its lowest since 1990. We have got retail sales coming out um, tomorrow. It will be overnight for most of us. Will be interesting. There's a lot of pressure on Japan. Um, Bank of Japan are intervening because they need to try and increase and raise the yen. Although future figures coming out, retail sales year on year look slightly up, but month on month slightly down. So, you know, just like the rest of us, they're, they're suffering from a cost of living situation as well. We've got retail sales coming out throughout the rest of the week as well. Um, we've got federal uh, Ch chairman Powell speaking at the end of the week, but a lot of uh, attention will be on things like the unemployment rates out of Japan it is expected to stay the same. But GDP, we've got GDP coming out of the States, we've got GDP coming out of Britain, and we've got it coming out of Canada as well. All expected to be around the same, although in the United States it's expected to shrink slightly quarter on quarter for the last quarter of 2023, which was the holiday period. Take it with a pinch of salt when you see GDP come out for quarter on quarter, the last quarter of a particular year, because that involves the holiday period. And of course, usually retail sales is up, production's up, and then we get a real understanding of the picture when it gets to sort of January, February, March, and the first, second quarter of a year. Please go ahead and use our economic calendar. It's in the, under the trade and tool section under trade and central. It's very good. It also mentions how many pips were moved according to the last news or the last few hours of that particular currency. We also see retail sales uh, coming out of Australia over the, uh, tomorrow as well. So this, although it's quieter compared to uh, previous weeks, it's still nice to have this quiet period so you can focus more on the technicals. You can focus more on the general news. Or if you just need to take a break, apply some risk management, practice some new strategies on the demo, all of it is encouraged just to make you comfortable. 
if we actually go and have a look at uh, stocks, we saw that Reddit actually started at $34 last week, did an IPO. An IPO is initial public offering. So basically, when you're a company and you decide to go public, you put a price or a price is evaluated for your share. And that's how it goes public. So you come out and you say, we are worth $50 a share, for example. So in Reddit's case, they came out at $34. They had actually in the first day risen up 48 cents. Um, on their first day, but it's settled to 30% a week later. That's still phenomenal news for Reddit. Um, a lot of focus will be on tech companies, especially as earnings are coming up literally within the next few weeks. A lot of them are tech companies, so a lot of eyes will be on Apple, Facebook, Amazon, companies like that, Twitter, or X, formerly known as Twitter. And Reddit is a cl classic example how they've gone with an IPO just before earnings, and this shows a real sort of desire. It's a real indicator for people's interest within the tech sector. If we actually also have a look at Apple, Apple have announced that come June the 10th, uh, sorry, June the 10th through to June the 14th is when they have their, their big seminar, is when they announce new products. And the reason there's a lot of anticipation about this is because last week they announced that they will be working with Google Gemini's AI system. Um, we're not sure in what capacity. It might be just applied across their products, but some are saying that on June the 10th to June the 14th, they're going to announce an updated VR headset, but with the Google AI. Could be a very interesting way forward for the technology. Um, so a lot of eyes will be on Apple shares. As we approach the end of the, the, the end of this month and into next month, we're coming up to earnings season. So you can be a bit sentimental with this. Find companies that you're familiar with that you've traded before. And um, as opposed to currencies where you have to apply a bit more, let's say, logic and research about and discipline, with companies like Apple, you can be a bit more sentimental. So that wraps it up for this week. Relatively quiet. We've had some significant uh, developments in Russia, in the conflicts in scenarios. Elections are building up and we'll cover more election news over the coming weeks uh, for different regions. But most of the elections are going to be happening throughout summer and towards the end of the year for example, November for the United States. My name's Anthony. I thank you for your time and I hope you all a lovely day, a lovely rest of the week, a good weekend, and we'll be back same time next week. Thank you.